Hello, this is the voice of Stuart Pierce, and welcome to my series of Deep Dialogues. These are vital conversations I engage in with global soul stewards from all over the planet, providing us with vital understandings about how we can create a new hierarchy of values to help us evolve into a brave new world. I hope you enjoy, and thanks for listening. Welcome, welcome, everybody. We have the wonderful Lars Mool with us this evening, who, of course, has been on the panel before. And I'm just, as our American friends would say, super excited about having Lars here, because this gentleman is an absolutely genuine channel of the significance of the divine feminine or the sacred feminine at this time. So welcome, everybody. Uh, you, you've entered into a very special vibrational field by coming to this dialogue. Please note, it is a deep dialogue. And so Lars is loaning himself to me in conversation. It's it's not this this platform is not about someone lecturing. It's about engaging in some really powerful thought-filled motivations. So who is this wonderful gentleman sitting before? And uh, to all of you, ah, here they come. Melody, Stacy, Stephen, Sarah, welcome, welcome, welcome. It's wonderful to see you. So Lars, Lars is a Danish mystic, musician and author who in 1996 was sorely affected by an unexplained illness, which for three years made him completely incapacitated. And then, through a dear friend, Lars was connected with a powerful seer in the form of, I always forget this pronunciation of this gentleman's name, Carl de Montsegur. Carl de Montsegur, yeah. Yeah, good, not bad. Who helped him see a way of regaining life and an entirely new way of living. As he gradually recovered, Lars became the seer's apprentice. And this profound transition meant that Lars began a completely new spiritual quest, which eventually brought him to write seven or eight magical and exquisite books. The O Manuscript was his first, moving into the Seer, the Magdalen, the Grail, the Wisdom of the Broken Heart, and his latest work, The Light Within the Human Heart. Lars, welcome. Thank it's you. Wonderful, wonderful to have you. Now you're um, you're you're one of the beacons of light on our planet within the human potential movement for the refraction of the sh shining light of the sacred feminine, and yet here you are, this wonderful man. So how has the sacred feminine impinged on your life? How has it changed your life? Oh, you know, I think any man. Uh, from when you start to become um, what you would call when the libido is really um, ignited when you are 11, 12, 13, uh, how old you, you are, and you f the first time, you know, Stuart, I remember there was one of my schoolmates at that time, I think we were 14 years old or something, that, that asked me what I like most about girls, you know, and he was thinking of their phys physiognomy, you know, their, their their bodies, you know, no doubt about it. But I could not really, I could not really go into that because to me, it was more about their presence or their charisma. I remember, and I think most men uh, remember first time they kissed one of the other sex or a partner or girl for my sake. And um, it, it was that magic moment when I just looked into her eyes and I saw that something that I could not explain at that time, but that made me connect in a way that would not have been possible if it was only physical, you know, if it had been about her breast or about her hips or whatever. So from that moment on, I think for most men, we start a, a path or a trip that 
without us knowing it, has the goal of towards the feminine, the sacred feminine, as a kind of end goal. And it is funny, I think, I don't know if you have ever thought about it, but everything, nothing comes into this world but through a woman or through the feminine, as, you know, as manifestations here on earth. And from the moment men come into this world through the woman, we try to somehow to go back the same way we came, you know, or that is a, have an attraction to us. And, and without becoming, you know, I think you know what I mean. It's, it's just that then the, the, the sex of, of the woman become kind of a sacred thing, a holy thing. Without us knowing it, it's just the attraction there. Uh, and it really, for many, many years, I thought about this, what, what it was, you know, that really, that attraction to to be with a woman on, on in an intimate level, you know. And of course, for many, many years, I probably did was attracted the same way as most men are attracted to women. But I never could fall in love with somebody if I hadn't had that connection with the eyes and that inner understanding of something that was unexplainable to me at the time. But I knew there was something that was more important than everything, anything else. So that was my... So very, very early on, I had a special connection with my with girls. I first and foremost became very easily became friends with girls. And then at one time I had more girl friends without having an intimate relationship with them, but really close friendships with girls and women all through my life. I have had that. Mm. So, uh, so yeah. what was happening for you psychologically? Why do you feel that that was the case? Because you're speaking of a behavior that you were drawn to the female psyche more powerfully. Um, mm. The the uh, earlier part of your exposition, I felt, is much more to do with those of us who are called to spirit, that mm. when we become intensely involved, yeah. it, even if it is with a sensual, sexual, or sensory capacity mm. in our beings, that we have this extraordinary due diligence about our responsibility to the nature of what that, that joy is all about. So yeah. it is base it is actually to do with finer feeling uh, for me it was the most one of the most important things and i'm not heterosexual so i totally relate to what you're talking about in the sense mm. of when i first fell in love the mm. experience of that love was about sacred sexuality mm. it wasn't mm. just simply about the baseness that we often see within 3d but no. from a psychological point of view what was it that drew you to the the company and the communion of your girlfriends? I think it was, um, f as you said, very early on, I also started to to study or to read, you know, I was 15 years old when my spiritual path started, reading books on, on the, the, into the Sufi tradition, which is very much also uh, taking the, all kinds of love into retrospect, you know, they take everything in, you know, and also connecting the spiritual with the sexual or with the libido, so to speak. So in that case, that that, that made, really made sense, you know. But still, without me really understanding it, because this is long before there were any understanding of, of these things in the West, you know. I mean, for many years, we also kind of separated love from sex, you know. Which is also to to in a, in a way to separate uh, sex from spirituality. So sex very much became a raw thing, uh, a commodity that could be sold and and bought, uh, not only with money but with you know to all kinds of arrangements between yeah. partners. You know, so it became a kind of thing that that like a currency, you know, mm. and which I also find it is today, you know, and that is why we, I think it's really, really important that we, we, we understand what the, what the sacred feminine is all about. Yeah. And a lot of 
women, for example, and men too, I guess, think that it has all to do with women. But actually it has uh, as much to do with men as it has to do with women, as the, the sacred masculine has to do with women and, and men, you know. So I, I found out at one point that, and that was when I was uh, doing, I was writing my book on the Mary Magdalene, and then I, I was connected to an old moon priestess at that time who was 92 years old, who were initiated in the order of the world mother. And she started to, to, to tell me a lot about the initiation and about the sacred feminine and what it really was, you know. Then, and she said, listen, the feminine, nothing comes into the world but through the feminine. That is why it is called Mother Earth. That is why matter in Latin means mother and materia. You know, and you can read in the Old Testament, for example, that when before everything was created, the Shekinah or the presence of God, which is feminine, hovered over the earth. And at one point I asked, but how could she do that when nothing was created, what kind of water are we talking about? And of course, it is the water of a pregnant woman. You know, it is a metaphor for that pregnancy that before anything is born, it, it is existing on the etherical level. And that is how that was meant, you know. So again, you have the feminine being very much instrumental of us being here on all levels. So that is why I, one of the main reasons why we, I think we find ourselves in so much trouble now is that it's, it's strictly, our, well, our world is strictly dominated by uh, patriarchal um, ideas and stuff, you know. So the, the feminine is still somehow manured out of the, of, of the where, where it's compared where it should be, you know. And I'm talking about there's a lot of women in power today that is not connected to the, the sacred feminine. But we have hope that this is the beginning of the great revolution, as we yeah, know. Exactly. And for example, right now in Iran, we know yeah. that women are aroused. And yeah, they're aroused absolutely. because their sisters have yeah. been oppressed by patriarchal power purely and simply because they wanted to choose whether they wore the hijab or not. Yeah, and so and there it, is, you know, and that's just one small measure, but it's yeah. a very powerful measure. Um, many, many people have heard me say this before, but you know, there's a Japanese proverb that says, when the women's voices are aroused, the mountains move. Yeah. What I'm really interested in, Lars, because I feel we're very familiar with, so thank you for what you've just described, but I feel we're very familiar with this landscape. But I would mm -hmm. love to know how the sacred feminine impinges on you, not from an intellectual point of view or from an ideological point of view, yeah. but deep within your physical membrane. How does it affect you on an emotional level? Hmm. You know, it's just... My masculinity is kind of centered to the feminine. Without the feminine, my masculinity would be a joke. It would be, um, it would be persposary. It would, it would be telling really, really bad jokes. It would really, really try to boast itself, it would try to, yeah, you know, to be a shallow um, interpretation of what the masculine should be. So the, the, the feminine, the sacred feminine to me is when that voice is being awakened within me and that, and I can connect to that archetype that I've always carried within me. I actually wrote a book called Taxoluma who is also present in my, my new book, The Light Within a Human Heart. And that is that book, the Taxa Luma, which is the name of my, my, my inner feminine principle, is actually, the book is the story of how I treat, have treated her all through my life, you know? Mm -hmm. 
how she just became an orphan, how she became a prostitute, and how she ended up becoming a messiah, you know, the female messiah. And to me, that is very much, I can also see how she has been treated by the world, you know, through history, as an orphan, as a prostitute, and now we are at the, the threshold of inviting that female messiah in because, you know, we should understand that the messiah is not just a male office. It is a state of being that everybody that is part of us all. And if you go to, for example, the, the, the rabbis of Israel who knows about these things, as I have done in my life, and ask them about the Messiah, they will tell you exactly the same. Messiah is not just one person that we expect. It's because here in the West, we, we, have, we don't know what the Messiah really is. Messiah means the anointed one, it, like Christ does. So the next question is, what is the anointed one? What, what is that meant? And we should also remember that it was in, in the story of our Messiah, Yeshua, in Christianity. It was his, um, his partner and probably wife that, in, that uh, initiated him with the anointing ceremony. Married mm -hmm. the him. Mm -hmm. And I think those two, if, if there was anything those two came to, to tell us, it's all about the sacred feminine and the sacred the masculine. So can you describe to us what you believe the sacred feminine in essence is? It is holding everything. You know, the feminine is compassion. It is hope, loving kindness, trust, and so forth. Actually, I'm, I'm reading... Uh, a very, very inspiring book, The Heart of Love and Kindness, by a chap called Clive Johnson, who sent it to me. And I, it just came together with uh, the Mary Magdalene's My Story, you know, that which, like your book about Diana, you know, I really feel a lot of comparison there. And I don't know if you have read this book of Marilyn Monroe, for example, but somehow despite what they go through, you know, like I also see that that, that that Diana, the princess of Wales, she went through a whole lot of crap, you know, uh, as the whole feminine is doing, you know. And now Diana, in, I can see, you know, she have, after she died, she have stepped into a higher um, uh, level of consciousness, you know, and she's suddenly representing the sacred feminine in a way, incarnating that on a higher level, as Marilyn is. Um, and it is this vulnerability that doesn't boast anything, but who is genuinely innocent in the way that Yeshua was talking about in the New Testament. Mm. You should be like children again. Not being, you know, like, mm -mm -mm. but, you know, take off your clothes and step on it. Show yourself, mm. naked, you know. Mm -hmm. That's what, what these women were doing, you know, in a way. And that is what I feel when I'm most vulnerable. I'm also my my most strong, you know. Yes, you know? this is who and, you truly are. So yeah. isn't this, you know, because what I'm interested in is the way it impinges on you. Um, because you have lots of wonderful thoughts about it, and they're all immensely valid and fascinating. But what I'm really interested in, it seems to me, you see, that the next level of our exposition of the sacred feminine is the way that we feel, mm. that, that feeling is the language of the soul. And so but moving deep into the vibration of feeling, we will actually embody a totally new texture of what it is to be a spiritual being having a human experience. So that vulnerability and fragility and sensitivity are actually lived as pulsations of our of our heartbeat and the rhythm of our breath, do you see? So that we become actually radiating presences of what the sacred feminine was all about, which mm. presumably is why you were magnetically drawn in your 
young manhood, we were talking 12, 11, uh, sorry, 12, 13, 14, 15, of why you were drawn to female companionship. It wasn't just simply because of your libido. It was to do with another higher dimension. How did that make you feel? Uh, you know, the what what do you mean? How does it make me, how did it, did it make me feel I, in, on what? But you did. sought the comfort of female company that wasn't libido driven. It was a higher quality oh. of finer feeling. So, how did it make you feel? Yeah, it, it, it made me feel uh, I want more. <laughs> I wanted more of that. Did but it make I, you feel safe? I could not at that time really put words on it. You know, I was just drawn towards. I but, know, but now but as you reflect. Yeah, but you know, I felt I was drawn towards it, not for the physical or for the sex only. It there was so much more to it, you know. It was more. It it was. I could not really grasp what it was, and that was why I I really tried to. Yeah. May I share with you my experience? Yeah, exactly. Very pleased. I was, I, I was a, a troubled child, not because mm -hmm. I wasn't surrounded by love. I had an extraordinary mother who was unconditional love, unconditional love, unconditional love. Really very extraordinary. A warrior father who was terrifying. Mm. And, and my father worked for the British royal family, so I was brought up in, this, in the diversity of what that patriarchalism was all about. Mm. Uh, the, of course, this was going back into the 50s when the, 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 the young Queen Elizabeth had just come to the throne, so she was defining her own route. However, um, I could not learn at school, but what I found fascinating, I couldn't read and I was profoundly dyslexic, and numerical sequences, I just simply couldn't compute. Um, obviously, I was working through an altered state of consciousness, and in fact, now I know I was synesthetic. So I was seeing sound as, co as color and energy. I was seeing literally waves and waves of sound. So to be taught how to read through a staccato rhythm just didn't have a profound effect on my body. Mm -hmm. Later, after two years of silence, I moved into reading uh, through song. And that, mm -hmm. in other words, through flow and through the legato aspect of song. However, so through, I just giving you context, through that time, being in the world was really challenging. However, whenever I was with the girls, I felt that there was a deep understanding in them for mm. what I was experiencing. As you say, I mean, we were children, so we didn't necessarily have the linguistic to explore it, but this was on pure feeling levels. So I felt comforted, I felt safe, I felt mm. secure, until the comp competition started. And mm. then I began to see not just the positive aspects of the feminine, but mm. also the negative aspects as they began to explore their own psychology and their mm. own complex um, interrelationship skills, where the bitch came forth, for example, and then, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, this is all, this is all the hurly-burly or the traffic of life. So we begin to observe this and make choices about, well, what am I going to illuminate within the conviction of my own lives? Am I going to choose that behavior or that behavior? Mm. It's, it, and, you know, when I think of all of the women that I've had great, the great honor and the great the great gift of being with most of my major clients have been female um, personalities, whether they be actresses or statespeople, or as you were saying, Diana, Princess of Wales. They have always made me feel as though I'm completely understood, whereas I don't find that so much with men. That's a sweeping generalization. So I was just interested in, as we live the sacred feminine, of course, we can talk about its history and the way that it's impinged on us. I mean, we know that something very dramatic took place at the beginning of the 17th century when we withdrew from the anima mundi that was the animating principle of the universe, always seen as the feminine principle. And so nature, of course, was something that we glorified and deified. And something radical took place when Isaac Newton said but that the earth is merely a lump of matter hurtling through space. It doesn't have a soul. And um, for us, the feminine was always the fact that there was soul, whereas the mental energy was in association with intellect. 
So when you work with women, as you see them before you and you arouse their fascinating intelligence about their own spirit through the, the anointing of the sacred feminine, do you find that they respond to your work more easily than the men do? Yeah, but I think it's also important to stress that it's not only about women. It this I mean I have I have uh, male friends who are very in, evolved uh, with their feminine side, and I think this is really important to stress. It's not just you being a woman then you you automatically are carrying it because this is something that have have to be developed within every uh, woman and every man, like the, the feminine masculine. So that. Uh, you know, I have also met women that I found, it, with first glance, I found interesting maybe, but found out that there was no connection, you know, because there, there was no mirroring. You, you know that, 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 that um, quote from Jeshua from um, a gospel of the Nazarene, where he talks about the feminine, where he says, I and my bride are one, exactly as Mary the Magdalene, whom I have chosen for myself is an example with me you know because here that that bride he's talking about is actually his own feminine principle mm -hmm. and that principle he have found mirrored in an earthly woman married the Macklin. therefore he have chosen him so this is very interesting i i think that first he finds his inner principle feminine principle and then he's able to communicate with that woman that mirrors that, and therefore they are part of. And mind you, that could also be two men or two women, you know, as long as they represented the opposites, you know. Yeah. So this yeah. is also very crucial, I think, to 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 take into this conversation and mm -hmm. this dialogue that this has nothing to do with man and woman. It has to do with masculine and feminine. Yes, well, that's what I'm really talking about. But as a point of definition, we, we, we have so much ideological exchange about mm -hmm. the nature of the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine. But what I'm, what I'm trying to get at, you see, is how does this impinge on the very fabric of who we are as human beings, not from an intellectual point of view, but from a feeling point of view? Because after all, we men, from an archetypal point of view, through the evolution of the last 350 years, and possibly much long, much longer, that we've been we've been asked to suppress our fragility, fragility, and suppress our vulnerability, whereas it's been endorsed within the feminine, within the fairer sex, as it's refer, was referred to from a, a classical point of view. So, for our listeners. What is it on a really archetypal level to explore the divine feminine when we have been educated and socialized and conditioned into a male domain? What is it? For me, it is that I can be genuinely me, the true me, with all my masculinity and my femininity, that I can be the one I am and express all the things that come through me. And I cannot be with um, a woman if that's not possible. You know, I, I find myself also now in, in a period of my life that I have not time for, for more kind of bull, so to speak. No. I, I have to be able to communicate totally what is coming through and who I am through that, that I am, which it has nothing to do me, with me personally, but is what must come through or else it has no value really for me anymore because we are all prone to drama and we are all potential drama queens. And I think this life have been, there has been too much drama and, um, to be caught up it forever will be just a waste of time. It's time to step out now, to step, take a step out of all this and try to see things from a more genuine and true perspective. And that perspective is maybe a little bit more 
feminine than it is masculine right now, what is needed. But it has to be the sacred feminine. Mm. That's the only thing I can really uh, say it, you know. And um, it is in the eyes of, of people I meet, men and women. And every time I see it, it's just my heart is just dancing, you know, because that is what the, what the time needs now. It's not just words about saying the feminine. But, you know, it is something to have to be manifest. We, I mean, we can talk about this for ages, but it, it's something that has to come through. And it doesn't mean that the masculine should stop being masculine, but it should be masculine through the mirror of the sacred feminine. Okay, so how does it come through? To to dare to to step out in the open, to dare to take it all out there. So and I think what you're describing is complete authenticity. Yeah, it is. When we rest, when we sink deeply into authenticity, which what I mean by that is fundamentally knowing self. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've gone through the individual pro individuation process where we've yeah. ascertained the male and the female, the outer and the inner, the effort and the free, the male and the female. And then we come into the very center of ourselves, mm. a very deep pool of stillness yeah. that is just brewing, as it were, or percolating and coming into a state of being. It's absolute truth, isn't it? Where there are no illusions. I think this is what you mean by no bull i think you said no bull no bullshit yeah, yeah. um and you know perhaps also we have drama kings as well as drama queens oh yeah but, well, uh, the, 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 the men can be drama queens as well no so the, the thread of this new level of becoming comes from this extraordinarily deep sense of personal authenticity mm -hmm. which is without illusion it's yes. fully integrous, so we express or radiate integrity. Um, how do we get there? By taking responsibility for it. Uh, by taking responsibility to stop being victims, for example. It's, it's um, the women I know who carries this, they carry both a, a, a very, very... Um, fragile femininity that really really calls that really attracts the masculine masculinity in me but at the same time that femininity take responsibility for itself it is strong in it and it because it is the mirror that opens my gateway to de a deeper knowledge of myself so in that way, it, it broadens the, the, whole, um, the whole idea of being here. You know, I think, have you ever thought about, Stuart, you know, why, why are we here and we are still uh, have to cope with, with some kind of uh, primitive, uh, yeah, just think about it. This is 2022 and they're still not far away from where we are people running around with guns and all kinds of shooting after it. I mean, just think about it. We, and we think of ourselves as evolved uh, beings, you know. I think there's something really, really missing here. And there's something totally wrong with our condition in this world right now. And I think this is... Well, we, what we are standing at right now is really to f understand why we are here. Why are we incarnated? Why, when at, at the same time are talking, having this conversation that we are having now about a higher consciousness level, and still, yet we are here on Earth incarnated. What is it all about? You know, I remember very early on my mother she told me that one of the first thing i have really said that 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 uh, steered her was i said why i asked her why is everything so primitive here as i had something to compare with and she she was so puzzled by it that when she told me i was thinking yeah i can understand that because that's how it is here 
it is really, really primitive compared to that level of consciousness that we have ability to read if we make the choice to do it, you know. From the world of questions, we can reach the world of answers. So but, energetically, you see, we, 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 again, we're talking about this, this higher quality of force. And maybe this higher quality of force, which is really what that great inspiration of in the beginning was sound and the sound was made flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. Maybe it's about bringing those higher energies deeper into our physiology. You know, we're hardwired to connect. And the, what I've always found with the safety and the security of the women that I've often been surrounded by mm. is that they connect instantaneously. Mm. Whereas the men that I'm with often compete first. Oh, yeah. But when, you know, and I've had many experiences, for example, of running a retreat of, for Palestinian and um, Hebrew women, mm. in uh, Israeli women in the Sinai, uh, mm. on the substance of grieving and seeing what the unification points were. And there's a wonderful woman who is with us this evening who is called Infinite Inspiration in the chat box. And she says, I love my man. Mm. I love this. I love my man because mm. he makes me feel protected, safe, mm contains me in his masculinity, mm -hmm. is passionate, is raw, and is very alpha when he takes charge. However, he is also nurturing, emotionally mature, and very sweet. Mm -hmm. That's, it's, okay. it's, isn't that wonderful? Oh, and incredibly intuitive is written underneath. So I think you, we should have him in here. And uh, you should make have a talk with him because there's something for us to learn a lot about it. <laughs> so infinite inspiration, my darling. I don't know who you are, but we yeah. love you. So please, can you bring this man forth? And so here, here, what what I was trying to do, you see, is to define what exactly is the sacred feminine and what exactly is the sacred masculine. And of course, you quite rightly brought them back into this exquisite balance because I know the woman inside me just as I know the man. Mm -hmm. And I think that what you're doing in your maleness is also saying, I know where the feminine, I know where the woman is within me. Mm -hmm. And part of our movement towards the great I am presence and the personal sovereignty of that statement is that the king and the queen sit equi uh, equitably together, that they yeah. sit in balance. Yeah. And of course, what this does is to open up the inspiration of our intuition. So we yeah. feel the higher levels become much deeper into our bodies. We yeah. feel more. And that's what's going to stop the war. Because mm -hmm. how can we possibly destroy anything when we're feeling deeply the pain of what that being, whether it be an animal or a human, or indeed the plant kingdom, when we feel the pain that these beings are going through, how can we possibly perpetrate violence? violence. And, you know, what I'd love to do is to move deep into the light within the human heart, your wonderful mm -hmm. book, The Light Within the Human Heart, because I know you've discovered a treasure trove in the, in the human heart. Could you possibly speak to what that means for you and what was the raison d'etre, what was the original purpose for you writing The Light Within the Human Heart? It is actually the light within a human heart. Ah, within a human heart. <laughs> yeah, and that makes a little difference, you know. Uh, tell us about it. It is that, as I said at one time, I don't know, it was earlier this in this interview or it was before we started that, we, we are already enlightened beings. And I think if we stop looking for that light outside of ourselves and instead would... Um, continue that path inwards toward that light that we are all carrying in within our heart. That would make a whole lot of difference. But I meet, I don't know about you, I meet a lot of people who, um, um, who are looking for the light, that enlightenment, and they go from one course to the next. But they are already enlightened. We are already enlightened. And there is a difference between the masculine light and the feminine light as long as we are incarnated here. 
But at the end of the day, it is coming from the same source. And that is what Yeshua is talking about in the Gospel of Thomas, for example, when the feminine is not feminine anymore, when the masculine is not masculine anymore, when the two become one, then they shall move mountains, or then they shall enter the kingdom of heaven. And remember, the kingdom of heaven is within you. So he's talking about exactly that, about the, 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 the merging of the masculine and the feminine within, and that is igniting that light within the heart. So you go to the supermarket tomorrow. That is, that's what really interests me, not any intellectual understanding of it, but to go into the supermarket or go out in our daily, everyday life and start to see other people through the heart and act accordingly, you know, not just talk about it. A thing like charity to me is totally a strange thing because charity what is it, it that we 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 in, invent something that is giving something to someone this is a natural thing it should be a natural thing this is the actually coming from that inner sacred feminine is that it connects as you said with everything it becomes one with everything when it it wants to you know and through that connecting, things are being transformed. And yeah. that is what I feel. And that is something we, that possibility is just about choice. And the moment we choose it, because as Jeshua, who was a prime example of a man who had found his inner femininity, he said, you should not hide that light with underneath a bushel. You know, you, it, it must come forward. You must not only, it must lighten up the whole world and yourself with it. You know, everybody should see by that light. Put it up on the, on the highest mountain so everyone can see it. And it should be just a natural thing that you don't have to boast about. You don't have to, you don't need anybody's approval uh, of, for being who you are. You know, so you should, we spend so much time to, to try to be good enough to, to be appreciated or to be approved of, you know, to be somebody. We are already somebody. We are, you are you, I am I. Everybody is their own representation or of that enlightenment that, um, that is the merging of the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine. That is the right mm -hmm. example that Jesua is talking about, and the Magdalene too. Yeah. So from, to me, it is something that, that must come through what we do. It's not only to talk about it, you know, because I, I know, for example, I have friends who have meditated for 30 years and who for whom it's like gymnastics, you know. It's like, you know, really competition. Who can sit the longest, you know. But when they go to the supermarket, they don't see that old lady over there that needs your help now. So yeah. to me, it doesn't matter about all this uh, meditation. You know, I can meditate anywhere. I can meditate in the supermarket. I can pray everywhere. And the moment I see that old lady and go and try to give her a hand, that is the, my inner feminine and masculine who is actually walking the talk at that moment. You know? Yeah. And that's what, all what matters to me. This yeah. is my church. The supermarket in that moment is my church. Yeah. And I'm the, I'm the one who's ministering in it at that moment. But I'm, the next time, the moment after, somebody is ministering to me, you know, because I just uh, dropped my, my purse without seeing it. And mm -hmm. he or her are coming, hey, mister, you dropped something. Yeah. You know, it's just connecting, you know, when you send out a smile or a, you look into another person's eyes mm -hmm. and connect, it is like throwing stones into a pond, the ripples from it. It mm -hmm. goes, you know, it expands to eternity. And if all, everybody was to, would do this, the, that was to me be the very best and effective way to install the sacred feminine in mm. our everyday life. And so could you explain into that? Level into our very own life every day. Could you just name that? What What is that that you're talking, because you're describing it beautifully, but in essence, what, could you just name it? 
It is, you know, I when that lady you just referred to for spoke about her husband, you know, if that man of hers is really living up to everything there, that is actually to me sound like a man who ha, have um, have merged both the masculine and the feminine the, within him. That is a perfect picture of what we are talking about, I think. So yeah. please, let's have that man come forward. <laughs> well, that's why, that's why I wanted to share it with you, yeah. you see, in the chat box. Because yeah. while I was listening to you, I'm, I'm balancing all of these balls that we were talking about. Yeah, earlier. yeah exactly. These balls and reading what's in the chat box because you know and by the way anybody um please all you guests out there if there are any questions that you want to ask of this wonderful man Lars you can hear that he has rich rich information please do just write it in the in the chat box um, one thing Stuart, I would also have liked here but that I would be later on because in my feminine uh personal inner feminine the principle in my latest book step forward representing the divine feminine as a messiah and the speech she she she's she's she hold in she's held in the book is um, a, 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 actually the essence of what i feel that divine feminine is all about and what she has to offer to the world right now because it's now and i think it's a choice all of us have to make now to see that this is something that had something to do with me and everyone else and each one of us has the opportunity to make the choice to go to to seek out both the masculine the sacred masculine and the sacred feminine yeah. and <clears throat> When we understand that, make the choice and start working with it to walk the talk, actually, then that sacred merging will appear and be a guideline, not only for ourselves but for everyone. Do you know in the in the tradition of of the tradition I work in, you know that today if you go to the rabbis in Jerusalem, you will hear them say to their congregation, they've actually invite married couples to go into the bridal chamber and mate as often as possible. Why? Because when they do that, it's not just a, a you know, um, a thing that happens, you know, without, they, they, they are purpose to it, you know. They know when they merge, when the masculine and feminine go into the bridal chamber together and merge, the Holy Spirit is manifested. Mm. And mm. that opens up uh, a portal of information mm. that comes from the, the merging of the two. You should yeah. imagine when you and I are talking right now, as we speak together, we are actually creating together a third entity on the etheric. And you could call it a friendship between us or a, as a, an understanding between us. But actually, that means that we have to, in a way, if it means something to us, to keep nourishing that third entity there. Because it is, it is now being ignited, that entity being ignited with the power of the merging of our talking together, you know, our speaking together and what we create together now in this moment. And if we have that understanding in everything we do, not only when we go to the bridal chamber, mm -hmm. but every time we become one with, that, with the other. And we do that when we listen and we speak, we have a dialogue, you know. That dialogue can also be silent, you know. That um, old um, Sylvia, that I have written about in my book, The Grail, who was a moon priestess of the order of the world mother. She said that there will come a time when, when lovers can merge and unite despite that they are on each, they are 100 kilometers away from each other. You know? It doesn't matter. You know? 
And um, that is actually true. So you see that this is the vision of the sacred masculine of the sacred feminine is actually as said in the Mary Magdalene gospel. She said, this is, it was in a vision I saw my beloved raised from the death, from the, from, from, uh, yeah. And um, the vision, you know, and she's pointing towards the future where we, this is the way that we now ought to, to invite information in to the, the sacred feminine, true visions that we are getting. But we need to open our hearts too, because the heart is representative of the feminine and the third eye. Exactly. So when they two start to work together, and actually, if you, you want to do a, a prayer, you can, you can, for example, inhale a mantra or a prayer, what you want, for example, I am, and you can exhale through the third eye. Unconditional love. It's very difficult to speak when you're inhaling, but yes, no, we get, you say it, yes, you say it yes, within yourself, you know, get the point of what you're talking about. Yeah. So, fundamentally, through being present to yeah. the holy instant, yeah, exactly, by being in reverence for each aspect of life, yeah, just preoccupied egoically with our own existence, but exactly. being reverence by moving forward and conducting ourselves gracefully and graciously we open we begin to open up an empathic connection heart to heart rather than head to head mm, exactly. and this is the bat this is the beginning of the balance of the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine but there's a great shift because after all we've been conditioned and educated and socialized oh, by yeah. But the overweening male, the cerebralization of our peoples. And I, I'm sure you find it, the majority of people that come, God bless everybody who comes, the dear ones who come, to uh, require who require help, and I provide it. But the majority are thinking in very confused ways. So this indicates to me that even though we have a lot of intellectual process and prowess, that they're not absolutely thinking as economically and as specifically mm. as they could. So it brings into question this substance that you were saying about enlightenment. Mm. Because I hear you when you say we are already enlightened, but what it is to be enlightened. And surely enlightenment is removing the confusion mm. with the light-filled fusion of who we truly are, so that we come deep into the corpus of our feeling capacities. But going back to the passage that you were talking about, would you like to share it with us? To what? The passage that you were talking about from your book. No, I think it, it'll be too too far gone now. But I think that uh, Nadia Landman will read it when she visits you in the in in uh, the beginning of the year, new year. She will read it there. Okay. Because uh, yeah, that would be the best. Beautiful. There's a there's a wonderful man um, in the chat box who's you know with us this evening and all the way from Sydney. Okay. Um, He's a very sensitive actor that I worked with um, when I worked on a show that he was acting in in the West, in, uh, in the West End of London. I, I think it was Charles. I think it was two thousand and six. Um, and he's saying, "Question, please. Do you see chakras as feminine and masculine? And can we use energy center focus to help balance our feminine and masculine energies? How do you feel about that?" I've never seen it like that. I never worked with it like that. Um, um, you see, the tradition I work in, the light body in which the seven chakras are to be found is called the robe of glory. And the chakras is called uh, the first heaven, second heaven, third heaven, fourth heaven, fifth heaven, sixth heaven, I was in the seventh heaven and so forth. It's all of in the Essene tradition. And in that there's no Division, di diverging between the masculine and feminine as such. Um, and you can see, if you read the Gospel of Thomas, which I would really recommend everybody to do, uh, there's a lot about 
uh, the masculine and the feminine, uh, and, and and the inner masculine and inner feminine. So this is very very old news, you could say, because mm-hmm. that Mister Tradition uh, two thousand years ago knew all about it. You know, mm-hmm. so to them it was very much about the bridal chamber and the merging within the bridal chamber, both on a physical level and on a spiritual level. Yeah. And they also knew, as we were talking about before, that every time two people interact together in one way or the other, it doesn't have to be sexual, but intimate in a way where we, we cross borders, you know, we are creating something on the third, on a, on, on a higher level, you know. So this is really, that is the result of the merging, you know. Mm. Mm. And that is really, really important to understand when we are, in everything we do, in everything where we go. And that, to me, is is the important thing. Mm. This becoming one with the other, you know. Mm. I, uh, many, many years ago, had a Sufi master, and he taught us through deep, deep sonic meditation of how to open up the, the 12 chakras, the seven personal yeah. and the five transpersonal. Mm-hmm. And the way that he did this was by encouraging the male vector in a clockwise direction we would spin Mm -hmm. the chakra and then to encourage the feminine vector in the counterclockwise direction so you have electrical and then magnetic electrical Mm -hmm. and magnetic so Mm -hmm. there is this balance of the two that bring us into um, what we were referring to earlier is that empathic connection, which is really the Holy Spirit, isn't it? It's really the Shekinah, where suddenly we move into a melding of both male and female. Although what's interesting in many cultures is that the Shekinah, the Holy Spirit, is a very feminine force because it brings mm-hmm. forth such a powerful level of wisdom, um, exactly. awakening the anima rather than activating the animus. So mm-hmm. Charles, maybe there's something there for you. Um, to add on to the wonder of what uh, of what Lars was sharing, um, any other questions? Any other questions? Because our time is running close. No, they're just um, they're writing wonderful wonderful statements in in, in uh, acknowledgement and honouring of the substance that we're discussing. Um, so going back into the final moments of our wonderful dialogue, Lars. For the immediate future, what is your major preoccupation in your spiritual work? It is actually what we are talking about, and it is by by, by experiencing it, and it is trying to not so much as we do now, just talk about it, but also to to try to live it, you know, yeah. and uh, also to feel how so true meditation and true just sit in stillness and together with a partner try to communicate yes. and to to feel this oneness on all levels you know and mm. to experience that beautiful to, uh, to make it part of the you know it is you know i feel that that bushel that jeshua is talking about don't hide your light underneath the bushel that mm. bushel is our fears, all the noise we are creating, all our, you know, dramas and whatever. So this must go. Hmm. If we get rid of the dramas and the noise and all the things that scares us or that we don't like this and we don't like that, get hmm. it away, you know, transform it or hmm. let it go. Don't hang on to it. Hmm. It can also be possessions. And yes. there, that flower or that sacred seed hmm. of loving kindness of empathy of everything is there you know and it is protecting nourishing and opening the open heart you know mm. it's all there here for you to take you know for free it doesn't cost anything we've reached you see ladies and gentlemen there's this wonderful circle from the beginning to this now this point of completion that Lars is bringing us into the very fulcrum of the unity consciousness, which is the all oneness that we actually all spring forth from and have become somewhat confounded by duality. So everybody, thank you so much for coming along and observing this wonderful, wonderful deep dialogue. 
Um, don't forget the next week, I have another wonderful man in the form of Ibn Alexander, who wrote the New York Times bestseller, Proof of Heaven. This gentleman was a leading neurosurgeon who went through a very extraordinary situation which led him to a near death experience and it changed the entirety of his being. But firstly, I'm sure you will all turn and bow to Lars for oh. the wisdoms and the beauty and the truth that he shared with us this evening. And so, Lars, thank you, thank you, oh, thank please, you. Thank, please, you. Uh, thank you very much. I bow for all of you, you know. Absorb, I, absorb, absorb. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Bring Thank it into your heart, bring it into your heart. The divine feminine is to receive, <laughs> the masculine is to give. So thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you very much. We'll go into completion and namaste, everybody.